This video is sponsored by established titles. You can try to resist, try to hide from my fist, but you know, but you know that you can't fight the Moon Knight. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. We are now at the end of Moon Knight, and throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down all of episode 6. It's filled with Easter eggs, comic callbacks, and we also want to talk about the rumors of what could be happening next. Full spoilers ahead, and I know it's early. So if you haven't had a chance to check out the episode, then check out now. If you've been following the channel throughout the breakdowns, then I'd really appreciate the thumbs up one last time, and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss our Doctor Strange breakdown. Without the way, thanks for clicking this. Now let's get into Moon Knight Episode 6. Okay, so first off, I want to talk about how the entire journey throughout the season was actually foreshadowed all the way back in Episode 1. Steven's fish tank contained a number of items in it, and now knowing what we know, these have pretty much set up the entire series. There was the Pyramid of Giza from Episode 3, then a journey into a head for Episode 4, which could be due at, the ship in Episode 5, followed by the Temple of Conchu, and lastly, the Gates of Osiris. Really great foreshadowing, and this series has been filled with it, also in regards to the moon. Throughout every time it's appeared, we've had different phases of it, and this all comes to a head in the entry when we get Arthur and Moon Knight having their final showdown in front of a full one. The episode is titled Gods and Monsters, which has a lot of meanings. This phrase has been used in a ton of things, including a Lana Del Rey song, and also a 1998 movie starring Ian e. McKellen. This followed the director of Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein in his last days just before his death. He watched his life slipping away before him, realizing that it was the end. In Lana Del Rey's song, gods are the people we worship, such as celebrities and public figures, with the monsters being drugs, temptation, and evil. Here it feels a lot more literal, with the gods being figureheads and the monsters being what both Harrow and Mark were turned into by being their avatars. Harrow was of course formerly Kunshu's, and he spent the series in many ways repenting because of what the god made him do, and also because he enjoyed it. Can I tell you a secret? I enjoyed dealing out pain on your behalf. Come the end of the episode, he's tied up in hospital with Amit bound to him, and this is why Kunshu orders his murder so that the god is finally gone. Now the episode opens fittingly with the song The End by Earl Grant, which recounts the closing of a chapter, but how love perseveres past this, and that it doesn't really end. Nice little comment on how Mark got his happy ending in the field of reeds, but he decides to return to Steven, because hey, what is that love if it's not persevering? Now, we pick back up with Mark where we left him after being shot by Arthur Harrow. Interestingly, Harrow shot him two times, potentially one bullet for Mark and one bullet for Steven. This opening tells the opposite side of the story whilst Mark was in duet, and I love how you can see the little tattoo on his follower's wrist as he scoops him out. At this point, Harrow teases towards someone else being in the body, which of course sets up Jake Lockley, who appears at the end. Sorry I'd have to be this way. Mark Spector, Stephen Grant, whoever else might be in there. Now Arthur leaves behind the golden scarab on Mark, but weirdly, his followers must have forgot Layla was there too, as they pretty much ignore that she was ever there. Harrow's staff transforms into having an ancient Egyptian axe side, which slightly resembles the blade of the one that Moon Knight had in the comics. These ancient axes were common weapons given to pharaohs, and we learn in the comics that Omit's original avatar was in fact a pharaoh. Layla gets down on her knees and picks up the scarab off Mark's body, which is when we see Harrow's caravan heading out. He pretty quickly shows how powerful the staff is by wiping out most of the police, but one is judged to be worthy, so he gets to keep his life. We have theorized that Omit did just want people that were useful to her cause, rather than actually good souls, and this is why the old woman was killed in episode 1, along with the homeless man at the end of episode 2. This is potentially because they would have caused a burden, rather than being useful soldiers, so Omit probably took the police out to demonstrate her power to the one who was most likely willing to follow. Now as for Harrow, he's a far cry from the comics in which he was a mad scientist that carried out human experiments. He had no connection to Omit or Egypt, however his experiments did focus on mummifying people, so meh, I guess it's a pharaoh inclusion to have that here, like pharaoh anyway. Moon Knight defeated him quite easily, but the show has done a master stroke of giving him not only the Doctor role from the source material, but also something more. It's important to bear in mind that the purple blasts we see are also pulling from the Dark Dimension, which is why they're able to wipe people out so easily. Now at this point, Layla readies herself to kill him, but Tara Warrett takes over her body and reaches out to her. She of course is a guide in the underworld, so it makes sense that she'd be able to reach out to those above. This sort of follows on from last week, in which Mark and Steven asked her to pass on a message to Layla. Now throughout the series, we've had teases that Layla could end up becoming the Scarlet Scarab. 
In the comics, this Egyptian character was called Abdul Al Fawl, and we know from the passport that Layla's name is Abdullah Al Fawli. Her father used to call her his little scarab, and along with the scarlet scarf, we also saw a scarlet scarab drawn on her finger in the hospital. Later on in the episode, she ends up becoming Tarawera's avatar, and she dons this scarab symbol, which is our first major fan theory that we predicted. Just ignore the other 20 we got wrong yet. Look, look over there, but remember, we got, we got that one right. Now, arriving at Giza, Harrow wipes out the Gizas there, aka the Ennead, which gives Layla time to grab Conchu. All these dead members leave the door open for more avatars to come in, and if we get a second season, then we could see brand new characters being brought across. I'm unsure if they'll bring back Midnight Man due to the death of the actor playing him, but if they decide to cast another person in the role, this could be a future path they take. Now, this video is sponsored by Established Titles, one of the best and funnest gifts you can give someone. As many of you know, I'm from Newcastle, which is on the border of Scotland. So, am I Scottish? In a way. Now, did you know there's a traditional Scottish custom to have landowners referred to as lairds, lords, and also ladies? That's why I was super interested in this project, which allows you to get at least one square foot of dedicated land on private estates in Ardali, Aberdeenshire, or Scotland. So, if you pick up a plot, you can refer to yourself as a lord, whilst helping to preserve the picturesque woodlands of Scotland. It's a great way to help the environment as well, as established titles will plant a tree with every order. They work with global charities like One Tree Planet and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. Now that also comes with this, bit of an ego boost on top of all the environmental stuff. You can officially change your name on credit cards and plane tickets to call yourself a lord. Also give you an official, official certificate. I am Lord Heavy Spoilers. Bow before me, punk. This confirms your lordship and also the unique plot number showing the exact location of your land. Mother's Day is also right around the corner, so established titles have put together an offer where you can claim an additional 10% off any purchase. I've linked it in the description below, and all you have to do is go to establishedtitles.com slash heavy spoilers and enter the code heavy spoilers at checkout. This will give you that additional 10% off, it helps the environment, and it also makes you feel really, really impressive. I bid thee farewell, my fellow noble and I shall see thou in the next part of the video. Goodbye. Omit is finally released, and like the legend, she's much taller than the other gods. She also has the braids that she had in the comics, linking nicely back to that. The more she feeds, the bigger she gets, and this is similar to the source material in which she was a giant beast, ready to feast on all that hadn't lived a kind life. Becomes clear at this point why Harrow has been putting glass in his shoes, and he's been desperate to release her. Guy clearly knows he's imbalanced, I think deep down he carried out this quest because he knew that if he served Omit, that he'd likely be allowed to live. It very much shows the hypocrisy in Omit's plan as she will wipe out those that aren't balanced, but will also use them as a weapon if needs be. She keeps going on about how she's here to bring balance, and we all saw how that worked out for my boy Thanos. Finally, Layla leaves Konshu, and he wants to enlist her straight away. Interestingly, he calls her his little bug, clearly trying to play on the fact that her father called her his little scarab, but not quite getting there. Now in the comics, namely the Jeff Lemire run, it was revealed that Conchu was the biggest villain in Mark's life, and that he'd been there from his childhood manipulating him behind the scenes. Conchu had deliberately fractured his mind in the hopes of taking over his body. That's why the speech at the temple last week was so Arthur harrowing, because it was both Mark and Steven admitting that Conchu had manipulated them into a thing that no one would ever want, like an El Muerto movie. Now in the end, Mark and all his personas united in the other void to crush Conchu's head, which in some ways does sort of mirror how his personas all come together to defeat the big bad here. The comic ended with him finally getting the god out of his life, and he looked over the city as the rain hit his face. Though he didn't know if this was real or not, he decided it was real enough, which was good enough for Mark and the other personas. Now come the end of the episode, we see that Conchu's still manipulating the guy, and that he's now using Jake. This makes me think this reveal in the comics is indeed true, and we do get some teasers towards it. The way he acts with Layla makes me realise he just cares about his avatars and nothing else, which is why he's like, well, no doubt Mark died fighting. Clearly just wants to replace him and doesn't really give a f Now Konshu and Omit end up going head to head, but just before the fight, Omit says, Konshu, time has been cruel to you. Indeed, I cannot allow you to proceed. My guess is that he originally had flesh and feathers over his face, which would be similar to how he looks in the legends. This is probably rotted away over the years though, giving him a more skeletal look. Back in the field of reeds, we find Mark and Tarawerit, which, I'm sorry how much I keep butchering that, I'm, I'm really just, I can't get it right, and I apologise for that. Now his heart is full, and he's finally at peace without the chaos that dominated his life. 
However, he can't rest because Steven is out there. I love the line about how he's manifesting everything around him and in the legends, the field of reeds was someone's idealized version of their life. Mark imagining his heaven to be like this shows how destructive his life was and just in the same way that he manifested Stephen to cope with his mother's abuse, he's manifesting this paradise to rest. But can he rest? Nope, he refuses to leave Stephen behind and he exits the field which transforms around him. Mark has a heart to heart with Stephen's corpse and refuses to abandon him and he freezes up as he places his perfect heart in his hand which frees Stephen along with him. In the comics there's a moment where the pair hugged each other and this brought them together completely which this scene symbolizes too. They now share a full heart instead of being divided which opens up the gates of Osiris and allows them to travel back through. I was kind of predicting that an external force would be the one that got them out there like Jake or Conchu but I actually prefer that they escape themselves. Sensing that he's alive Conchu once more resurrects him which is something that has happened several times in the comics. Every time Marcus died Conchu has brought him back and though the transformation is a bit iffy effects wise with the floating head it's a nice way to show that Moon Knight has returned. I do really love this suit and along with the Mr. Knight one they make a new deal with Conchu. He promises to release them both and with the Ennead no longer judging him he's able to turn back the night sky. At this point Moon Knight jumps into the sky creating an effect over the moon that looks like a crescent one. Really nice imagery and I feel like it's riffing on the shot in Batman 89 in which the Batwing flies up over it too. Layla finally becomes Taro Hippo Lady's avatar and we learn that her father was taken to the field of reeds so that he now lives in paradise. That's a bad outfit god damn. I just kind of wish the CGI was better as it is a bit distracting when she opens up her wings. There's a lot of movies being delayed now even though cinemas are open and this is actually because there was a big backlog in VFX so I just don't think that the artists have had enough time to fully polish things like this. It's a real shame as it did kind of take me out of the moment even though I know these guys would have been pushed for time and trying their best. Now Moon Knight flies to the pyramid and he battles it out with Harrow on the side of the structure. This shot has been used heavily in the trailers and I love the way that they tilt the angle on the camera so that the pyramid is sideways. It creates a lot of smaller sideways pyramids making for a really cool shot. Flying through the night sky Mark jumps back and forth between himself and Steven showing that they have now fully accepted each other and that it isn't a fight for control. In the streets of Cairo they battle it out whilst Omit and Konshu have a kaiju fight against the pyramids. Really nice idea for a final battle that hasn't happened in the comics before and it's great that we get the guards going head to head whilst we also have the ground level fight. I love the constant persona switching even if we get the little corny bit you know the corny bit where Marvel has to hammer home that they indeed have an Egyptian superhero now. Look representation is important and this is probably going to mean a lot to little kids who are finally seeing themselves in a superhero so I'm just going to avoid my 33 year old cynicism and be like Matt, you know what, good for you. I'm an, I'm an old person and you, the kids will probably like this. Now Mark gets stabbed with his staff and at this point we get another blackout like in episode 3 to find him on the other side of it in a position of power. I did theorize that Harrow would have him beat and that the Jake persona would come out but I was expecting us to have that as the introduction rather than the blackout that we get here. Now Jake Lockley was someone we've expected to see for a long time and there were lots of clues throughout the series to hint at him coming up. This actually has major basis in the comics as Mark explained to Steven that though they met in his childhood, which we saw play out, Jake didn't arrive until much later on. Jake is very much a way to protect both Steven and Mark when things get too tough for them which is why he ended up killing those people in episode 3. Episode 1 of course had the date scene which I doubt Mark would have arranged because he was still married to Layla and though he was attempting to get a divorce it was to protect her and it's clear that he still loved her. There was then the accent change in episode 3 which also came with a Chicago cap. I'm looking for Senfu's sarcophagus. Hey, look, what the hell are you doing here? The accent change it was also later featured in episode 5 during Harrow's office. You're not a doctor. No, I, I feel real. I feel like a real doctor. You're not a doctor. Also Harrow brought up how he'd been starting fights in the hospital which didn't really seem like something either Mark or Steven would do. There's also been tons of reflections in the series and the vast majority of these have featured two extra people in them. There's the museum glass which had two people in, the mirror in Steven's apartment and the one in the triangle when he woke up that all foreshadowed Jake being here. Now I'm so glad that they have him in and though it is a bit of a cop out to have the angle switch all of a sudden, it's nice that they have this looming mystery still hanging over everything that newcomer audiences will still find some excitement in. Back at Giza they call on the gods to trap Omit and she becomes bound to Harrow instructed to kill him and the god, Mark refuses and he's released by Conchu. 
However, come the end of the entry, we learn this is a f***ing lie and that he still has a deal with Jake. As of now, Mark and Steven are completely unaware of him and it seems like he's the only persona who can take over the body at will. Therefore, I think that he's going to be able to jump into it without Mark or Steven ever knowing and they'll have no idea that Conchu is still using them. Jake also appears with hieroglyphics under his collar, further teasing towards Conchu's control over him. Now, Upon being freed, Steven and Mark go back to the asylum with Harrow. The pair unite and finally break free of the trappings in their mind and they both wake up in Steven's bed to the same song by Engelbert Humperdinck that appeared at the start of episode 1. I can't play this like I did in that first breakdown as Engelbert he bloody claimed the video, but a nice inclusion here. Now there's also the two goldfish, symbolising how the pair are now swimming in the same tank. He goes face first, and though he isn't with Layla, he's clearly more accepting of his other side. Now going wild with it, potentially this is all still in his imagination, and the pair are actually stuck inside the head, believing it's real, whilst Jake is out there in the actual world. The show has played with our emotions at several points, and potentially it could be happening. It's something we've been over in depth several times and I've milked it quite a lot. So I don't want to do your head in by repeating every single aspect of it. But it's the only way that Mark's brother Roland could have drawn the one fin goldfish unless Steven somehow managed to find one exactly the same. I love that there's this undercurrent to it and this of course has been something that's happened in Joker, 12 Monkeys and Shutter Island. Again, it's a bit of a tenuous theory that has kind of been debunked. I'll admit it. Yeah, I'll admit it's been debunked. But I would love to see it if it was revealed that we had so many things repeating because they were trapped in the fantasy whilst Jake was actually out there. Cut to the post credit scene which takes place in Sykenwitz Hospital. This is a reference to Bill Sykenwitz who, I'm so sorry for getting all these names wrong, who is an artist that has worked on Moon Knight before. Here we find a rubber ducky and Harrow in a wheelchair much like how Mark was. This looks exactly the same as Putnam in his mind but it has the yellow filter over the top that Hollywood loves to add to shows set in Mexico. However, when we pull out to the final shot at the end, we can see it's in London due to the gherkin. He's escorted outside by Jake, who arrives in his classic cap from the comics. Whereas in the source material he was a cab driver, here he's a limo one, and he wheels Harrow out there after killing one of the orderlies. I did try scanning the QR code at this point about 30 times as well, but with it being at an angle, my phone wouldn't pick it up. Normally these all lead to a free comic and if you manage to do it then make sure you leave a comment below with what issue you got. The license plate on the limo also reads SPKTR which is of course Spectre. This pulls directly from the comics even down to that detail however it belonged to Mr Knight rather than Jake. In the limo Conchu sits in a suit based on that persona which also popped up in the Lemire run. Conchu tells him he has a new friend, Jake Lockley who speaks Spanish. He executes Harrow in the back of the limo and the pair ride out to the moon hanging over everything. Now potentially all of our grasp that the accent changes are wrong and Jake might just speak Spanish going forward. He could very much also represent his mother's aggressive side and be formed because of this. I love the moon that hangs over this final shot in the daytime and typically Moon Knight operated at night. However this shows that Jake is now breaking free of that and moving on to working in the day and there is a lot to take from it. Now I am kind of settled on the theory that Mark and Steven might be trapped in the mine with Jake running around, however this final shot in London shows they could all be together and not aware of each other. So going forward there's still a lot of things they can do with Moon Knight and I'd love to see the Midnight Sun series or movie coming soon. We of course have Blade going into production first which will likely pick up the conversation between him and Dane Whitman from the end of the Eternals. This was also set in London so it's the right place and right time for their meeting to happen. They ended up going on to help form the Suns, which Moon Knight was also a member of. Though they haven't introduced Ghost Rider yet, I'd love to see him, and I think they can get together a great team of soups that tackle supernatural elements in the Marvel Universe. What I want to see from the future of Moon Knight is that, but in addition to it, I also need some closure on the Raoul Bushman storyline. First mentioned in episode 5, it's clear he caused not only a lot of anguish for Layla, but also Mark. Bushman is the perfect villain for next time as he pretty much was the reason that Mark ended up becoming Conchu's slave and he's also the person that murdered Layla's dad. He was originally supposed to be in the series but Mohamed Diab said that due to his similarities with Killmonger that they skipped over him. If we get more from the character though it just makes sense to include him and yeah that's kind of what I want to see if he ever comes back which you better bloody come back. Now as for my thoughts on the series I know I say this every time and I've come to grips with the fact that I suffer from recency bias but this is up there as being one of, if not my favourite MCU Disney Plus show. Yeah, Kevin, back, back the money up, back the money up, I've, I've said it's good. 
Now, I think that the series has not only stayed very consistent, but it's managed to improve almost every single week, and there's been some brilliant moments that have made me question exactly what's going on. Oscar Isaac has delivered some phenomenal performances throughout, and we've laughed, cried, and also got a globe-trotting adventure that feels like it's ripped right out of myths and legends. On the opposite side of this, I think Layla was an incredible addition, and in the comics, I always found Marlene a bit boring, but May Kalamaui, which I hope I pronounced right, she knocked it out of the park. Also, let us know below what we're going to get more comments for. Pronouncing May's name wrong or Tarouette. You get an amazing prize if you get it right. Now, in addition to this, there's Ethan Hawke who really brought his A-game to the role. He was intimidating, menacing, but he also had his softer side when he was manipulating people that made you realise how dangerous he was. All around great performances, and though the CGI suffered at points, there was enough good here that I just kind of ignored a lot of the flaws. However, I do wish that they showed Moon Knight a lot more, and though he had some big scenes at certain points, this was clearly more about the psychological aspects of the character rather than being an action show. I do like the fact that they tackle deep themes like that, but in an ideal world, I think we would have got more of a balance with these moments, but also some focus on him being a superhero. I think this might have a bit less rewatchability than some of the other shows, but for a first journey, it was really well thought out. Now saying that, I might actually go back through the whole series, as there's a ton of foreshadowing and I'd love to see how it all pays off. Now unfortunately, I thought this episode was probably the weakest one in the series, and Marvel do have a bit of a problem sticking the landing with their shows. Outside of Loki, I think they've all ended a bit meh, but I am trying to judge the series as a whole, rather than just this one entry. Now in terms of ranking all the Disney Plus shows so far, I would probably go Loki at number one. I love the multiversal aspects of it, the reveals were big, and there were also actual stakes to it that had great ramifications for the MCU. Next is Moon Knight for the review I've just given, and after that is WandaVision, which still holds a place in my heart due to the week to week journey everyone had with that show. I still don't think a series has matched the hype of it, and the production design on the old TV shows was absolutely perfect. After that it's Falcon and the Winter Soldier, for me what if goes on from that, and then it's Hawkeye Last Witch, though I enjoyed it, just didn't get me as hyped as the other shows, and when re-watching Daredevil, I realised that they kinda dropped the ball a bit with Kingpin. So overall, great series with Moon Knight though, and I'd of course love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments below. We are in a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Spider-Man No Way Home on the 15th of May, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our Doctor Strange theories, which will be linked on screen right now. It's our final video before seeing the movie, so definitely go check it out right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you in the next one. Take care, peace.